Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome back to today's uh, session on Regis. I'm actually not going to be your moderator, so I'm going to introduce the moderator, uh, who is Filippo del Carro. Filippo uh, is a good friend. He's a fellow sci <clears throat> scientist at Jefferson Lab, uh, who is a theoretical nuclear physicist. But uh, today he's going to introduce our speaker, who's not going to be talking about nuclear physics, but uh, I thought he, he would be a a great person to moderate this session. So uh, thank you, Felipe, for taking your time and thank I'll you. pass it on to you. Sure. Um, welcome everyone to the ODU, Reyes uh, Seminar Series. Today, we have uh, Francesca Gallo, who is a postdoc at the uh, NASA Langley Research Center. She joined uh, us uh, recently. Be before she was uh, working uh, in the DOE Atmospheric Radiation Programs at the uh, Los Alamos uh, National uh, Laboratory. And uh, to be more specific, a research is a focus on the key mechanism that drive uh, aerosol properties in marine environments and the impact of atmospheric aerosols on uh, radiation, clouds, and climate. That's what she's going to talk about today. Just uh, to give a um, background of uh, her, um, let's say, academic life, she earned uh, her PhD in uh, environmental uh, chemistry from the University of uh, Azores, Portugal. At, uh, we are glad to have uh, her uh, here in the area and uh, today in the seminar. So please, Francesca, if you want to, to start your seminar, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Filippo, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. OK, can you see it? Yes. OK, let me get And it's full screen. OK. okay perfect. And so also thank you everybody for attending my talk today. I'm very excited about this opportunity to share with you my passion for atmospheric aerosol science. And actually I got in this field only a few years ago uh, because my career path wasn't always like, let's say straightforward. And before I became an aerosol scientist, I work on other topics in the environmental field. So now, before jumping in the amazing world of aerosol science, I'd like to show you uh, how I got in this field. And, uh, okay, did I move the slide? Yeah. Okay, so my journey starts in Italy where I was born and I grew up. I've been interested in environmental issues since I was young. And I always been very curious about how human activities, the so-called anthropogenic activities can affect the natural system and climate. So uh, after high school, when the time to start the university came, it was a, let's say kind of natural to me to enroll in a bachelor program in environmental science. And I think uh, this is a very good program because it combines together multiple, multiple sciences like um, biology, chemistry, physics, uh, uh, geology. And these uh, give the opportunity uh, to build up uh, a broad understanding of the health processes, but also understand better uh, the impact of human activities on the, on the planet. After the bachelor, I proceeded with a master degree and I focus uh, this time my studies, my studies are more on environmental policies for um, climate change, change mitigation, sustainability, and also uh, renewable energies. Then uh, in 2009, once I graduated, I decided to take a gap year and uh, I volunteered in the Balkan areas in Kosovo, where uh, at the time um, there were several uh, um, humanitarian organizations that were el helping the, the local communities in the, in the post-war recovery. That was uh, an amazing experience uh, that helped uh, me to grow. And so when I, I came, I went back to Italy uh, after Kosovo, I felt I wanted to spend some more time abroad and I also wanted to start to use it what I learned during my master's degree. And so this brought me to participate as an intern uh, to an European Union program, uh, which is called uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And within this program in 2011, 
I moved to Azores, uh, which are uh, which are uh, nine islands in the middle of the Atlantic that you can kind of see here in the in the map. But uh, anyway, I have a picture that I will show you later. And there, uh, I worked uh, for a local company, uh, like an intern, to analyze the data of the domestic energy consumption in the archipelago for evaluating and planning the utilization of uh, renewable energy. Uh, and then I, I was there in Azores, uh, and during my internship, I realized that I really like to live in Azores, and I also discovered that at the University of Azores, there was a research center for climate and global change. So uh, in 2011, at the end of 2011, I got in contact with the director of the center, and I started a short um, period there as a research intern. And eventually I wrote a proposal for a, a PhD that luckily was granted and, um, and founded for four years. So um, what I did during uh, my PhD is, uh, okay, here. Um, since I was in the middle of the Atlantic, I wanted to focus my research on investigating how the increase in CO2 levels due to anthropogenic emission affect the chemical and physical properties of the ocean, and as a consequence, uh, the marine phytoplankton. Um, very briefly, why this is an important topic in, in climate. So we have to consider two different pieces of the puzzle. First, first thing, marine phytoplankton. You can see some picture of marine phytoplankton here on the right. Um, uh, they are pictures that I took during my PhD. And the marine phytoplankton are uh, unicellular organisms, are uh, plant-like organisms that consume carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and move it in the deep ocean um, with a process called the biological pump. Um, they uh, produce half of the world oxygen. And just for you to have an idea of how important phytoplankton is, we can compare it to the oxygen produced by all the rainforests of the plant of the planet that together it's about only the 28%. The second piece of the puzzle is that due to human activities, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere has increased more than 20% in the last 40 years, causing increase in global warming temperature. And these add and actually have consequences on the ocean, which is also the main sink of CO2 and heat on the planet. So um, what happens is that the ocean uptake of carbon dioxide and heat causes a decrease in, in pH in the water. So the water is more acid, but uh, um, also the surface of the ocean is warmer. And these lead to changes in ocean chemistry and circulation, um, but also in the rising sea levels and increasing storm intensity. So what I did during my PhD was to design and conduct several experiments to answer to um, this, this question, the first question. And, uh, Unfortunately, uh, the experiments pointed out that, that uh, the changes in the ocean properties causing by human activities are likely to negatively affect phytoplankton physiology. And these uh, will also have a potential feedback on global climate. So coming back to my journey, in 2016, I was finishing my PhD. Um, I was looking around, around for new opportunities and I got very interested in what was happening on the closest island. Uh, and you can see here a picture of the island, Graciosa Island, because uh, the US Department of Energy Atmospheric Radiation Measurements Program had, and actually still has, a fixed facility there where uh, they collect the measurements of aerosol and cloud properties. And uh, during that year, in 2016, uh, they were also planning a field experiment called aerosol and cloud 
cloud experiments in um, Eastern North Atlantic for the subsequent year to collect uh, measurement with measurements with um, this plane that uh, you can uh, you can uh, see it in the picture. So as soon as I started to learn more about uh, ARM, I became fascinated by the complex interaction that are that there are between aerosol and clouds in marine environment. And so I decided that I wanted to improve my understanding of the atmospheric systems. And I decided to apply for a travel award that allowed me to spend three months at Los Alamos National Laboratory in spring 2017. Uh, there, uh, I learned a lot about the aerosols and clouds properties, uh, our measurements, uh, um, aerosol instruments, uh, and also how to analyze uh, and uh, interpret uh, the aerosol data. And then I was there at LANOL uh, for this uh, short scholarship, uh, and uh, I was offered uh, a position as graduate assistant, and then uh, this position became postdoc, and so eventually, I became an aerosol scientist. And now I'm very happy of this because um, I love this scientific field. And eventually in March I move, uh, of this year, I moved to NASA, to the Langley Research Centers. And uh, I will explain you uh, what I do there. But uh, before that, uh, let's talk about the aerosol. And uh, oh, sorry. So, um, when I speak about aerosol, very often people think about something like, like this, about a, a spray can. And this because uh, in the 80s, the media used a lot the word aerosols to refer to spray cans that release chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere and damage the ozone layer. But to the scientists, the uh, aerosols uh, means uh, something different. So aerosols, uh, atmospheric aerosols, uh, are suspension of liquid uh, or solid particles in the air, are uh, everywhere and uh, exhibit a wide range of uh, size, uh, chemical composition, and uh, optical properties. The size of the particles spans over five, four to five order of magnitude, ranging from few nanometers to about 100 uh, micron. And just for you um, to have a reference and understand better how tiny aerosol particles are, you have to think that the smallest virus are about 17 nanometers, while the diameter of a human hair is about 70 nanometers. The great variability uh, of aerosols in size and the chemical composition is due to different sources and the formation mechanism. So based on their origin, aerosol particles can be divided in two types, primary and secondary aerosols. Primary aerosols are particles directly emitted from the source in the atmosphere. About uh, the 90% of the primary aerosol mass has natural origins, and the, the most abundant are dust and sea salt. Mineral dust is a key aerosol species, especially in dry region of the world, and uh, consists of a small grain of dust and sand. Uh, the sea salt, uh, is produced at the surface ocean by bubble bursting, mainly induced by breaking waves, or also um, via diffusion. Both the mineral dust and sea salts are uh, relatively large, with, um, and they, they usually present a diameter of about one micron. Also, a large fraction of uh, natural aerosols are produced during volcan eruption, Biogenic emissions uh, from vegetation are another source of aerosols and includes pollen and other small organic particles with a coarse size. Biomass burning from wildfire um, is also a prominent source of aerosol in the atmosphere, especially in the, in the last few years um, due to the intensification of wildfires around the planet. 
The rest 10% of primary aerosol mass is generated by human activities and originates from uh, urban and industrial emissions due to, due to the combustion of uh, fossil fuel, but also from domestic fires and uh, smoke from uh, agriculture, uh, agri agricultural burning. Second, aerosols instead are not produced by a specific source, but are produced in the atmosphere from the oxidation of precursor gases that condense on pre-existing particles and form a new particle. So secondary aerosols are usually very small. They range from a few nanometers up to one micron. And also uh, in this case, uh, as for the primary aerosols, uh, the origin can be both natural due to vegetation and marine emissions, and also anthropogenic due to gas pollutants from fossil fuel combustion. An example of natural secondary aerosol source is the, in the marine areas are some species, species of phytoplankton called coccolithophores. And you can see a picture of, of one coccolithophore here on the, on the top of the slide. And this, uh, this uh, small organism produces biogenic sulfates that contribute to both the formation of new aerosols, so the formation of new particles, but also to the growth of existing particles. The residence time of aerosols in the atmosphere is very short and typically um, goes between a few days to a week. Uh, but the aerosols can also travel for long distances. So for example, if you think about a small particles moving at a mean speed of five meters per second and remaining in the atmosphere for a week, uh, this particle will be able to travel for around 30 3,000 kilometers. So it's very common that these dust plumes from SARA, as you can see here in the picture, cross the Atlantic and they can reach the Caribbean area or the Amazon and even the United States. Um, here you can see in the picture the, the dust that goes from SARA to the ocean. The special distribution of aerosols also varies a lot uh, in function of the location uh, and the source. And uh, to show you this, I wanted to show you a video from NASA. And, uh, okay. So here um, in this video, we can see how the aerosols are distributed and move around the globe. So in brown, we have the mineral dust aerosols which originates from dry desert areas. And this area, this dust, as you can see, can move from the Sahara Desert until here, the coast of the United States. Biogenic aerosols, which are produced by vegetation, are concentrated around the rainforest and the boreal forest, and you can see them in green. And then we have in blue the sea salt aerosols, which tend to have the highest concentration in turbulent regions of the ocean. And finally, in white, you can see the smoke from human activities, which is mainly concentrated in the northern hemisphere. Okay, we can skip the rest of the video. Or maybe not. Oh. Okay. So, uh, no, sorry. okay. So, why we study aerosols? Because aerosols have been implicated in human health problems and also exert a variety of impact on the environment and climate. And what we, I wanted to discuss with you today and what I do is to investigate how the atmospheric aerosols affect climate. So uh, aerosols in, uh, interact very strongly with solar and terrestrial radiations, and they can have both direct and the indirect impact on, on climate. 
So depending on their physical properties, they can uh, absorb or scatter the solar radiation, affecting the energy balance of the planet. And these are described as the direct effects. So most of the aerosols scatter the incoming solar radiation, cooling the atmosphere. Uh, there are only a uh, few aerosol types uh, that can absorb uh, the solar radiation and thus uh, warming the atmosphere. For example, here uh, in the pictures on the, on the top, uh, you can see a um, particle of sea salt on the left and uh, particles of uh, volcanic ash uh, on the right. And uh, uh, you, you can see that uh, these particles are uh, bright or uh, translucent. And so uh, they tend to reflect nearly uh, all the radiation that they encounter and cool the atmosphere. At the same time, uh, there are other particles like the black carbon produced during the combustion. And you can see them in the picture on the, on the bottom that are dark. And so they absorb solar radiation warming the atmosphere. I wanted to show you an example of how this direct effect work. Here in the picture, uh, you can see the eruption, eruption of the Mount Pina, Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. During the, this uh, eruption, uh, particles were created and uh, been, they, they have been ejected in the atmosphere up to a height of 60 kilometers above, above the, the surface of the Earth. And so those particles arrived in the stratosphere and remain above the clouds for several, several years, scattering the solar radiation. And these uh, have caused uh, dropping global temperature of about uh, 0 0.6 degrees Celsius for about four years. In addition to scattering or absorbing solar radiation, aerosol can also uh, alter the reflectivity of the planet, the, the so-called albedo, albedo of the planet. And so if you think about uh, bright surfaces, like for example, the snow, these surfaces will uh, reflect the radiation and cool the climate. But uh, other surfaces that are darker, like uh, for example, the ocean, instead uh, will absorb the radiation and then produce a warming effect. But uh, what happens if a bright surface is covered by dark particles? So here we have an example. Uh, this mount, mount in New Zealand, that in 2007, uh, because uh, um, of uh, an eruption, the uh, surface of the mount was uh, the, the snow, uh, the surface uh, that was usually covered by snow was uh, covered by volcanic, volcanic ash. And so this uh, changed the reflectivity of the surface. In that ca case, uh, luckily, um, the layers of dark particles uh, was soon covered by fresh snow. But uh, a big concern um, is uh, if we think about uh, aerosol from uh, wildfires or from industrial pollution, and they, if we, that are black, and we also think about uh, how aerosol can be transported in the atmosphere, we can see why uh, the Arctic could uh, soon be covered by, by black aerosols and that could lead to, to me the melting of snow and ice. So overall, aerosols have a cooling effect on climate and since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution have contracted about the 50% of the warming caused by greenhouse gases. So it happened to me, uh, people asking, uh, okay, so aerosols have a cooling effect and so they are a good thing. The answer is not, for uh, several reasons. First, uh, because they have uh, bad effects on uh, human health, they have, they have been implicated in uh, pulmonary disease. Also, um, unlike the greenhouse gases um, that are dispersed widely and have a fairly consistent impact from region to region, the distribution of aerosol is not uniform, and we saw it in the video earlier. And so the impact of aerosol is most strongly felt on a local scale. 
And uh, finally, the effect of aerosols on the planet, uh, it's not uh, just uh, limited to changes in global temperature, but aerosol can also affect the precipitation patterns, wind, and atmospheric circulation. So the answer is not, the aerosol are not the solution to global warming and are actually a bad thing. Um, aerosols also have an indirect effect on climate. So all the changes in cloud processes due to anthropogenic aerosols are referred as indirect effect. Uh, the aerosol particles can act as a site at which the vapor, water vapor can accumulate and then form cloud droplets. And these aerosols that have the ability to do this are called cloud condensation nuclei. In cloud environments, as you can see here, an example on the, on the left, with uh, low atmospheric aerosol concentration, natural aerosols are the most common cloud condensation nuclei. And the clouds are composed by a very uh, few um, um, cloud condensation nuclei and uh, they have uh, and large droplets. As a consequence, these clouds are uh, dark and translucent and the reflection is kind of low. Instead, in polluted environment, uh, in the atmosphere we have a high amount of aerosols that may also increase the number of cloud condensation nuclei. And this uh, led to more but smaller cloud droplets and these small droplets make the clouds look brighter and dense, and, res and the result is a higher reflection and a cooling effect. Also, um, smaller drops um, require longer time to grow, to reach a size at which they can fall as precipitation. So this effect that is, uh, that is called um, cloud lifetime effect, may enhance the cloud cover and does additionally cooling the, the planet and it can also have effect on atmospheric circulation and um, precipitation pattern. So as you probably understood the interaction among aerosols, cloud and precipitation are very complex. And, uh, in the last decades, uh, major efforts have been focusing to improve uh, this, uh, the, the understanding of the, this interaction. But uh, many questions uh, um, are still open, about, uh, especially about uh, the competing impact of, of uh, aerosols, so absorption and cooling and warming, or uh, the cooling and also the, the, how they interact with uh, greenhouse gases gases and precipitation. Uh, the only way to um, reduce uh, the uncertainty that we have is uh, our in situ and remote sensing measurement that uh, can provide uh, all the information to, that can be used in um, climate models and so constrain the accurate future climate change production. But, uh, and, and this is what uh, the atmospheric science, uh, science uh, does. So, um, but uh, now going back to, to what uh, we do at NASA. So on the left, uh, you can see how was a typical day in the office uh, before 2020. And uh, on the right, uh, you have the typical present day at the Langley Center. Now, clearly I'm joking. Um, working at NASA Langley is amazing. Um, I work in the NASA Langley Aerosol Research Group experiment. You can see the team here on the right. And uh, we are specialized in uh, in situ and uh, remote sensing measurements of uh, atmospheric aerosol and clouds. And so um, personally, I spe specialize in aerosol processes in remote marine regions. 
And currently I'm working on aerosol data from a five years investigation um, that occurred in the Western North Atlantic between 2015 and 2018. And uh, during this field campaign, they were employed ship, aircraft, and satellite observations. And the goal of the campaign was uh, to understand the influence of biogenic aerosol ocean emission due to the annually phytoplankton bloom to aerosols and cloud formation in the marine boundary layer. So this is uh, actually very exciting to me uh, because uh, here I can apply my expertise in, the ma in marine phytoplankton to the aerosol science. And basically uh, what I do is uh, analyzing all the data sets that I were collecting during the campaign. And um, then I interpret them to provide a characterization of the vertical profile of aerosol properties over the ocean. And so uh, try to find the link between atmosphere and the ocean ecosystem. And uh, before uh, to finish, I just wanted to show you like uh, the, how the, the data I'm working on, they look. So like, uh, for example, here we have uh, a plot in, in which I compare the number particle concentration between different days and looking in function of the altitude. And also here on the top, we can say we can see some example of vertical distribution of aerosol particles in the in the vertical column. And uh, here also uh, some other meteorological measurement. So what I do, I put together all this data and I try to find the answer on how aerosol and clouds interact between them. And so this is all. And thank you for attending my talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. And um, here you have my email address. And so if you have any questions or comments, please contact me. Okay, thank you very much, Francesca. It was uh, really interesting. It was, uh, I really enjoyed it, even if it was not the typical uh, physics uh, talk that we have usually at JLab with you. So I don't know if anyone has a question in the chat or in the attendees. Unfortunately, the one following on YouTube cannot ask uh, us directly. So <laughs> just uh, if anyone has questions or comments or just... Uh, curiosity about the global climate and uh, environment or even just NASA. Please uh, go ahead, raise your hand. And see in the Q&A if there is anything. Uh... So yeah, I, I try, I mean, it's yeah. not very easy to explain what I do without explaining what the aerosol are and uh, no, no, the, interact uh, with clouds uh, and, yeah no and i think it's interesting because i mean we always uh, hear about uh, global climate or let's say the climate is affected by human or uh, natural uh, let's say activities so finally we see <laughs> how we know you know when we yeah. talk about scientists climate scientists it's always a hot topic and we finally see what's going on yeah. and, I had a curiosity, by the way. I don't know if uh, we already have uh, those data, but uh, did we see any change in uh, 2020, for example, because of the pandemic? In the... Uh, so, yes, there are um, some data already. And huh. actually what we saw is uh, an increase in global temperature. Because uh, um, since uh, we had the lockdown, we emitted less aerosols in the atmosphere. And so the cooling effect was lower, but we still had a lot of greenhouse gases, which have a lifetime in the atmosphere longer than the aerosols. And so what we saw from the first data and from the first investigation that they just came out, we saw that actually the temperature this year were a little bit higher. Yeah, and I think we are, uh still seeing the effects because this year we had a record on the temperature even uh, in the U US in, uh, in Canada. But uh, yeah, and uh, I, I mean, no, that's interesting it's because it's, it's due to the time scale of the two effects, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah so, sure. Yeah. And uh, 
also lately we saw more wildfires and so more production of black carbons and more sulfur. Right. And uh, yeah, we, we classify the wildfire as natural sources, but it's all not, not always like that, probably. So we also have anthropogenic effect. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And uh, wait, there is a, I had another question, but there is also another uh, question from the chat, which is, uh, can RSOs also contribute to ocean acidification? So. Uh, Yes, I mean, not acidification. Okay. Um, wh what they, they can do is uh, like uh, when we transport, uh, when there's, uh, there are transport or Sarah dust to the ocean, if uh, we have like, for example, uh, uh, particles uh, rich in iron that can fall in the ocean and can modify a little bit uh, the phytoplankton productions, so also the chemistry of the ocean, but not really acidification. Acidification is due to the high concentration of CO2 um, that enter in the, in the ocean. We saw that the ocean is the main sink of CO2. And so because of that, the, the pH of the ocean decreases, and so we have ocean acidification. We also have uh, ocean carbonation because the pH decreases, but we have more uh, concentration of carbon. Okay. That's... Yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay, Ooh, another question. You want to, from Alex? It is possible to trace back the origin of the aerosol from your data. I mean, what? to get uh, the geolocalization. I, I so... didn't understand, sorry. So the question is if, uh, if you can basically track your aerosol to get uh, if, where they are from, like the location of a... Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I mean, we have satellites, images, images. Oh. And also when I analyze my data, I can tell you, um, I can kind of tell you where the, the aerosol are coming from because I can, I can see and I can understand their composition. And so if I'm looking at the aerosol in marine regions, uh, remote re marine, re marine regions, like for example, North Atlantic, where the concentration of aerosol are usually very low and uh, are natural, and I see there black carbons or smoke, I can tell you that probably it's a, a plume from a co uh, continental uh, regions like the United States or, or uh, Europe. The same thing if I, I see like uh, very big uh, particles uh, like dust, uh, I can tell you that probably are coming from the Sahara. And then you can also look at the back trajectories of the, of the um, air masses. And so try to put all the piece of the puzzle together and say, okay, during that day, we had a uh, um, transport of particles from the United States to the North Atlantic that uh, they affected the aerosol properties in the vertical column. So it's what I actually do. Okay. Let's see if there are any more questions. Otherwise, I, I also had a, like a quick question. I know that it's not really your uh, what you do, but uh, are there also like studies not to just uh, understand how they are so uh, like act naturally, but also to influence climate to the use of uh, to the use of uh, aerosols. Like, Excuse me. Is it is there also some studies about how to influence the climate uh, like uh, directly? I know that it's not uh, oh, really oh, what okay. you do. No, no, I, I understand. Like uh, um, limiting the, the, the rain or uh, make uh, yeah exactly or just to, yeah yeah, yeah. The, there are studies and they uh, there are experiments so uh, i think this uh, was uh, a method I used also during the olympi olympiad uh, i don't remember there in, Wait, china. in china maybe yeah in china yeah, yeah china yeah. somewhere <laughs> so, yeah this is a method calling seeding what okay. they do is to produce more cloud droplets. I mean, more cloud condensation nuclei, as we saw, that uh, makes uh, a rain. Uh, I mean, they create the clouds 
and and so the, the, if they want the rain uh, and they have more cloud condensation, okay, they can make the rain coming. Okay. I, I think what they did in China was uh, the opposite, and so they they seed the clouds, so they they send this particle inside the clouds uh, like days before the Olympic the the games in mm -hmm. order to make a raining before and have a good weather during the games. Well, that was, uh, yeah, also yeah. <laughs> trying to get rid of a so smog or pollution. Yeah, yeah also. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are studies about that. It's not what uh, I do, but yeah. there are studies about that. And there are experiments. And I think they, they do it in a, a lot of different places in the world, also here in the United States. Ah, I see, I see, okay. Yeah. Especially they do it uh, for the, the places where uh, they don't have enough rain uh, and so they have problem for uh, agriculture. It makes sense, sure, to, yeah. um, to eliminate some uh, drought, for example. Yeah, but, but uh, actually we still don't have uh, data to explain uh, what Yeah, is. better yeah. to understand yeah. it completely because, before touching it, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah, on the longer period. That's a good, uh, good point. Yeah. Oh, we have also a question from a uh, keynote. We don't, I don't know. It's uh, saying amazing presentation, by the way. So it's congratulations. And there is asking, how oh, challenging was it to go from ocean to the clouds? I guess he's asking about your career. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so it wasn't uh, super easy, uh, just not because of the uh different uh, field uh, also because of the techniques so uh, i went uh, from working uh, in a lab uh, with uh, unicellular organism to working uh, on a computer and that analysis so i guess this this was uh, the the main difficulty that i had um oh, in understanding the interaction between aerosol and clouds and the ocean system, I think my PhD in ocean, in the ocean field kind of helped. And so, yeah, yeah, because you have a bigger picture of what it happens. Okay, yeah, sure. I see. And, uh... but, but actually, now I, I'm very happy of what I'm doing. Oh, uh, yeah. I just, yeah, I really like it. I really like it. I see, I see. Yeah, I felt the enthusiasm during the presentation. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, just one more question, if I, if I can. I, yeah, sure. I wanted to know, like, the creation of Aresol is a positive uh, feedback uh, process. I mean, if you have more, um, more Aresol in the atmosphere, it leads to the creation of even more aerosol is just or it's just a negative feedback so it just uh, go down naturally or... so um as you see the the lifetime of aerosols in the atmosphere it's very short okay so usually after 10 days of the creation creation they, they just fall as drop or uh, as we saw, like the secondary aerosols, so they stay in the atmosphere and they modify their chemical composition. They just stack with other gases and they produce other kind of aerosols. So coarse particles like the sara dust or sea salt, they, they basically rain yeah. Yeah. In, in very short time. There are other particles like a break black carbon that are concerned because they can modify their chemical composition in the atmosphere and they can rub to other particles or to other gas. Okay. And so, yeah, this is also not super simple. It's another area. Yeah, but, I guess. Yeah, you see uh, aerosols can be transported for a lot of kilometers for long distances. And so during that time, they can mix, they can change their com chemical composition. They can also change their shape, their color, and so reflect the, the light in a different way. Yeah. I see, I see. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, uh, now I, I get a more clear picture. That's yeah, it. Okay, picture. okay, thank yeah. you. Let's see if there is any more uh, question from the audience, otherwise uh, I think we can uh, 
probably conclude with a, there were already many, but I don't see anything. Not even from the, let me check. I'm checking all the channels for them to ask. Yeah, I'm very okay. happy I could share my, my work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And give like a general picture of how our soul are important for us. Yeah. Okay, then uh, thank you very much again. And uh, thank you yeah. for uh, coming to the ODU Reyes uh, program. And uh, thanks also for the audience. Oh, oh, wait, 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 there is something. I oh, know, just uh, <laughs> another message to thank you and have a great day. <laughs> Not a really question. Thank you. Okay. okay. Bye. And uh, so, bye. Thank you very much. Bye, thank Francesca. You.